Okay, welcome, Laura. Thank you very much for accepting this invitation. Yeah, it's a fun thing to do right now since everyone's kind of stuck at home, huh? Yeah, that, that was the idea when I started this. I was stuck in my house in Colombia. I, we cannot travel nationally or internationally, wow. not even by car. Wow. Uh, so I have no shows. I can, I can work from home in my legal things, but that's all. So I thought this was a good idea to bring the community together. And we've had wonderful people accepting our invitation and we're delighted to have you here. Yeah, I was excited to be invited. Everyone's talking about your, your Zoom meetings, so. So thank you very much. Uh, Laura definitely doesn't need any introduction. Everybody knows her. <laughs> we are all great fans of you. And when we were deciding what topic we should discuss with her, uh, we thought about the idea of dressage essentials and probably more asking questions about different things. So I have received a lot of questions from people all over around the world. Oh, good. I have questions for you. So just this is a very easy conversation very relaxed. People will ask questions through the chat. I already have a lot of questions for you. Uh, so this is, this is the way we're going to do it. Okay. Yeah, I think that's great. I think it's better. I think a lot of people maybe know my story and have heard, heard me tell the story of Verdades and all of that. So I'm, I'm happy to participate in whatever people questions they have or whatever they want to know. And um, I think it'll be a lot of fun. Okay. So I'm going to start with the first one. Uh, I'm sure you have had, you know, many, many, many good trainers. And then my first question would be, what are the best recommendations that you have received from your trainers? Oh, that's a hard one. There's so much good advice you get and it's hard in just one second to look back. Um, but one of the most important pieces of advice I ever received was um, to make sure that your horse is perfect from a veterinary standpoint uh, before you go pushing on them in the training. And that means not just, you know, the flexions, making sure their hocks are comfortable and so on, but their, the, your farrier has done its job, your saddle's fitting properly, your bridle fits properly, and to make sure that all of those ducks are in a row before you go pushing for, for asking more of them in the training. Okay, that's a wonderful advice. And honestly, this is the first time that we talk about that topic here. So that gives me a very good idea for our next, for our next dressage talk about. I know, I think we're a little uptight about talking about that kind of stuff. But I honestly say it's like the biggest part of my job is making sure these horses are managed properly. And that, that doesn't happen in the saddle. Yes. And, you know, it's not only the veterinary issues, but as you said, the farrier, the right beat, um, the right surface. Yeah, exactly. Uh, a good saddle feeder. Uh, and I think that's very, very, very important. Okay, so let's move on. Once, once you have established that, we all talk about the training scale. And uh, you're very familiar with that. And I've heard you talking a lot about that. <laughs> uh, but I have, I've had many, many questions, probably because people realize and have heard that Verdades was not the easiest horse in the world. So a lot of people has asked, how does she handle tense horses? And how was she able to to reach such a wonderful performance with Verdades. What, what would your tips be for horses that are a bit hot? Okay, so hot horses are my favorite kind of horse. A spooky horse, it doesn't bother me at all. Um, and as far as the training scale, you know, I think all of those pieces are so important. I do, however, firmly believe that um, at certain points they're interchangeable. Sometimes one piece that's maybe in the, the typical training pyramid 
uh, ranked a little bit higher. Sometimes it becomes a little bit flip-flopping with the block that's under it. Um, that being said, I think you have to treat each horse as an individual and figure out the best way to communicate with that horse. Um, and that's, that's really the fun part of our job as trainers is to get these different personalities in the barn. Um, and I'm lucky that most of my personalities are horses and, and not, you know, the people also that I have to figure out, but I teach the people to figure out the horses, um, and, and how those horses want to be communicated with. Um, and I think, especially when you have a hot or a spooky horse, uh, horses by nature don't want to be bad. They don't want to make us irritated with them. And so I think it's important to understand that. And even though we have to set boundaries from a safety point of view, that we always have to keep it in our minds that we never, never touch these horses um, with anger. And if it ever gets to that point, then, then you have to get off, you have to take a break. And even if I come strong with my leg or I'm strong with the reins or I'm strong with a whip, it is never with the intent of, of punishing a horse, but only with the intent of educating them. And I do have Verdades to thank a lot for that because um, as a young adult, I, if I got out of hand with him, if I lost my temper at all, which I mean, come on, 18 years old, I think we all get to that point. Um, and he just immediately put me in my place and he had zero ill intent. You know, he always has a smile on his face, but he um, just didn't handle that type of unfair treatment at all. And it really taught me um, the type of, you know, human that I want to be for my horses. And so when a horse is hot or a horse is spooky, which I really think of as two different things, um, Verdades was both, which can be a little tricky. But the one thing I never questioned on him, because we had to do so much um, trust building, I never wondered if he was going to go into the ring. I never wondered if, if I put my leg on and said extend, or I put my leg on and I said pee off, I always knew he was going to try. And I think because we had encountered so many things that made him fearful, and I had to really step up and lead him in a fair way, um, by the time we really got into a, an arena where people were watching, even though he was trembling on the inside, um, he always did what I asked him to do. And I think that actually has made him a more secure horse by learning dressage and to be on my aids and, and what my leg meant, what my hand meant. And it made him feel proud of himself that if I closed my leg, he said, oh, I know what that means. I, I'm going to go faster. And that gave him a little bit of something to kind of learn to beat his, beat his chest. And of course, now 18 years old, um, he, he drags everyone around the barn here. So he has no confidence problems, but I think that's the best thing you can do for a spooky horse. And I find a lot of people, uh, if they come to my farm for a lesson, say, and the horse is nervous, they tend to want to try to relax that horse and they go, there, there, you're fine. Relax. And the horse is going, who are you? You know, you never talk to me this way at home. And I think it's just, the best thing we can do for them is to say being on the aids for me is, you know, we use the word submission in dressage a lot, but for me, the word submission is equal to understanding. If the horse understands, they will say yes. And, and that's kind of my philosophy of, of training horses. Yeah. At the international level, we have talked about changing that word submission for ah. cooperation or, yeah. or any other word, because it's not, Probably is not the best word that we have there for the collectives. But then going back to fearful horses, like what you, you have gone to the most impressive venues in the world, you know, from small competitions to the big indoor arenas in Europe. Do you do something in particular to train for those big venues or just the idea of having the horse in the eights? That's what do you work for? I firmly believe that a horse on the aids won't have a chance to even um, take a look around. And I always promised Diddy, you know, that in that 20 by 60, nothing will ever interrupt that. I'm not going to turn you into a jumping horse. This 20 by 60 will always be empty. That is your job. <laughs> and, and for the most part, it worked. Um, but I... Yeah, I do think there's, there's nothing in particular when you have a horse like that. If you said, 
okay, oh, he's afraid of umbrellas. I'm just going to conquer the umbrella. And you focus on that. Okay, well, today it's the umbrella. Tomorrow you get to the World Cup and it's the LED scoreboard. You know, you're never going to have enough days in your life. You will go to your grave before you find everything that a spooky horse is scared of. So rather than trying to tackle every individual thing, I try to just train the mind of the horse to turn inward to me and to be on my aids and that no matter what is happening, I always want the horse to feel like I'm driving him away from danger. Not that I'm, you know, stepping on the gas pedal and pushing him into it. Good. Getting, getting prepared for this, for this dressage talk with you. I heard you in an interview when you were talking about not maintaining the legs away from your horse, but keeping your legs with your horse so that he's also confident with your legs and so that you just touch him for a counter depart, let's say, and then he, he will be, he will get a heart attack out of it. Would exactly. you elaborate on that? Sure. Um, and I find it both ways. So I always say it's important to use your leg the way you want the horse to react. So if you have a horse who's a little bit sharp, a little bit, you know, goosey or, or hyper or hot or whatever you want to call it, um, it's important for me that I don't use my leg to encourage that, but rather I try to almost swaddle, you know, the horse with the leg. So it's always around them. And so even though for us, you might feel like you're barely touching his skin, um, it's going to come as almost a surprise to that type of horse. And so if my leg is always on, it almost makes my aid a bit more dull for him. And, you know, alternately, if I have a horse who's a bit more dull, I tend to use my leg in a bit of a louder way. So rather than putting it on their side and keeping it on their side, I sometimes ride with a looser leg or a quicker leg or... Um, just depending, you know, I always I say that use your leg in the way you want the horse to react. If you want them to be quieter, you have to be quieter. And that doesn't mean um, being sneaky. <laughs> you know, I think that's a little bit where it gets confusing is people go, you know, they treat the these hot horses like a bomb. And they go, okay, I'm just going to sneak around him, sneak around him. But the second you touch it, it's still going to explode. So you have to you have to kind of get a, a good firm firm grip on that that bomb and give them a real stable place to to feel comfortable because even if you don't think you're being sharp, you know, the lack of contact, whether it's the mouth or the leg, and then the sudden touch in the horse's perspective is still going to make them very reactive. Okay, thank you. That's great. And could you give us any specific tips that you had with your horse, with Verdades, and we'll, then we'll talk about different horses. But how did you handle your warm-ups with him? You know, I think the warm-up is something that changed over time, um, as it should, right? The training of the horse should change over time. Their experience changes over time. My mindset as a rider changed over time. I think a lot of, a lot of times we find the riders getting to the warm-up too early, not because their horse needs 10 more minutes, but because they're nervous. Um, And so I think, you know, in the beginning, it, and it's always a learning curve, and that learning curve changes as the experience of the horse changes. So I think when we were first starting in the, let's say the small tour, um, and I was always under the impression, I had a coach at the time who was 45 minutes. That was the magic number, 45 minutes. And so that's what we would do. And we would do our 15 shoulder ends this way and our 15 shoulder ends that way and blah, 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 and run through the whole test. And then um, we started picking up the Grand Prix work. And a little bit, I gained some confidence. And I had a trainer who said to me, you know, you don't need to sell your horse in the warm up. You don't need to run him around like a maniac. You don't need to prove to anyone that you have a nice horse. Laura, everybody already knows. And it was like this epiphany I had. Like, oh, because I'm looking around and all these other Grand Prix horses with their legs around their eyeballs. And I'm thinking, I want to make mine look like that. And you start riding sometimes for what's happening around you versus really focusing. And, and that takes, I think, a bit, of, um, a bit of time and just, again, experience uh, through that way that you don't so much look at what's happening around you but you trust what you're doing is going to be good. 
Um, so as that developed in our relationship and in the venues, and we kind of proved that he was a very reliable type of force, um, it just became about a couple, a couple small things, you know, at the, the biggest shows. We might take him out in the morning, let him have a nice forward stretch, uh, maybe 30 minutes. And then it, and this really can make a person nervous. But at some of the biggest events, Olympics, World Cups, World Games, I think I popped on in maybe 15 minutes before a test. And, you know, he's already been warmed up in the day. He's now been walked a few times now before I'm on him a second time. And so that second time I get on him, I can already just shorten the reins and put him together and maybe feel a couple of the transitions, make sure he's nice and loose, feel how he's going to be in his brain. Um, but the horse, you know, at that point knows the job. And, and I honestly really feel that, when it comes to showing the horse should know the job. I never, never want to show a horse who isn't secure in that level. Um, because I think it's so important that they always have a good experience at a show that they, they learn to like going into the show ring and not to feel defeated when they get in there. Um, and again, it was a learning curve for both of us that I had to learn my horse, um, how he would warm up and also train myself to be patient in that way, <laughs> which is sometimes harder. Yeah, I know. You touch a very important point, and that is communication with the trainer. Because sometimes you go to, the, to your horse show, you're ready for the warm-up, and then you have your trainer saying, like, you know, regular 45 minutes. And then that day you're feeling like, I may need more. I know my horse. Yeah. Or I may need less. I... I walk him in the morning and I think 15, 20 minutes will be more than enough. How did you handle that with your trainers and what advice would you give? Um, you know, I always played very naive. <laughs> I would, oh, I'm late to my warm up. Whoops. I thought we said 11, you know, 37 or whatever. Um, so sometimes I would play that game. But again, as I got more, uh, you know, you shouldn't have that relationship with your trainer. I agree. You should have, you should have a type of relationship where you can say, Hey, I sat on him this morning and I'm just going to get on at this time and let's see what happens. Okay. You know, I want to encourage all of my riders to be their own trainer and I'm here for advice. But if you feel something about your horse, you should know him better than anyone. And you say you want to try something new. You know, I might say, okay, well, this will be fun. Let's put our seatbelts on and see how it goes. But we learn something every time, you know, and so it certainly should be a conversation, but I don't, I don't ever want to not have the input from my riders. How, how, I have this question is from one of our participants. How do you regulate adrenaline versus nerves? Like one thing is one thing and the other hand, how do you handle that? Yeah, I still don't know. I, I'm not sure I even know the difference. I remember the first time, so I used to get very, very nervous when I would show as a kid. Um, nervous to the point where I would actually throw up. I would get so sick, I would throw up. And um, which, okay, why does anyone do this? I, I don't know, but I, I did <laughs> and I kept going. And um, I took Diddy to his first show in Wellington um, at the Jim Brandon Equestrian Center. And I was, he was a handful. And I was just very worried that, I mean, my biggest fear was always getting bucked off at a show in front of everyone. So that was my fear. And I was nervous and I had already been sick that morning. And I got on him and he loved it. He was a little nervous leaving the warm up and going into the show ring, but he was better at the show than he had ever been a day in his life on the farm. And it was like, it turned me into a new person where I said, Oh my God, we can enjoy this. This is kind of cool. And so it was like that for, for most of our career. Um, and our first really big event, um, you know, the world games in Normandy, I remember right before the Grand Prix, I, I don't normally eat before I ride and I had, you know, Robert Dover and Debbie McDonald were both standing there and it was about time for me to go in and we're pulling boots and I'm putting on my jacket 
I said, I don't feel good. And Robert said, oh, you're just nervous. I said, Robert, I don't get nervous, but my stomach has this strange feeling. It's like in knots. I don't know if I'm going to be sick or what. And he said, Laura, those are nerves. And I kind of sat back for a minute and I thought, okay, I'm nervous for the first time in a long time. And it kind of came as a surprise. But for me, it's, it's all manageable when I'm in the saddle, you know, because I feel very much in control. And I think it's important. Um, and I express to my riders to try to identify why they're nervous. And if you can identify why you're nervous, I think it's easy to, to realize that it's not that big of a deal. We, we are dancing with horses. I mean, there are real problems in this world, real problems right now, especially. And so you miss a flying change, your horse runs backwards in the payoff. Most of us have been there. And anyone who judges you negatively, it's because they haven't. And anyone who hasn't been in your shoes, I just don't really, you know, try to take their, their opinion too seriously, especially if it's a negative one. Um, and I do find that our sport is changing in that way. We're becoming more and more supportive of each other. And I think that's, that's really an important thing because none of us try to come to the arena and, and have a bad performance. And so it's um, something that makes all of us very sad when it does happen for another rider, even though we're competitive. And of course, I want to be the best. I don't want to be the best because somebody else was bad. I want to be the best because everyone was excellent and I was just the best. Um, so I think the community around that, and I'll be honest, I actually find more of a community in the CDI international rings than I find in the national ring sometimes. I think it's very hard to be on that side. Okay, and this leads me to another question. Uh, what would you say is the big difference or what are the main difference between judging in the, writing, I'm sorry, in the US and writing in Europe? And how was it like to break that 80% barrier? Like, what was the feeling? When did this happen? Did it happen in the U.S. or did it happen in Europe? And how did it um, Okay, so the major differences, I mean, other than initially being completely starstruck, again, so I thought I had conquered that whole, like, show ring, you know, pick your job off the ground and focus. And then you get to Europe and it's like every, everyone who I ever had a poster of on my wall as a child is now riding circles around me, literally. Um, and so it's a bit like being, you know, again, like this teeny tiny minnow in a giant ocean. Um, but I got to be really comfortable in that place. And I think that's a good thing. Um, there really aren't major differences except in your head. I think we get really comfortable here um, because it's a lot of the same faces that we see. And so initially um, going to Europe, you know, I don't personally know the steward. I don't personally know all of the, the judges or the volunteers or the person in the media tent. And here, you know, all of our CDIs for me happened in Wellington. You get to know everybody. And so that's a little bit uh, by itself, leaving your comfort zone. Um, but I think also the... Um, it tend to be riding a bit more in better company, really competitive riders, really world-class horses. Um, and it makes you better. It really makes you dig deep and, and, and ride better. There's something about being in that company. Um, and that being said, you know, kind of led me to my 80%, which was, it did happen in Wellington. Um, and, It was, you know, we had been working a little bit with David Stickland. He does all of the score analysis. And with Diddy, you know, we always focused on his pee off. It was always, always his weakness. He was so damn hot that his hind legs were just always out of control. So even at home, if we could get him to sit a little and get him to relax a little, it rarely happened in the show ring. And so we fixated on it right? Which is human nature. You focus on the weak link, you make it better, you score higher, right? And David came along and he said, you know, Laura, you have all of the pieces for 80%. Your horse does all the parts of the test for 80%. 
you just never do them at the same time. <laughs> I said, that's interesting. You know, we're over here schooling the heck out of his payoff transitions. And David said, forget about it. If, if, if it scores a seven, a seven, five, you're fine. You might not improve that today. But what you can improve is the way you ride the test. And if you can string together, he does everything else for an eight, a nine, or a 10. String those together so that it gets to be foolproof, you know? And, and that became more of our focus in the riding was not that I rode the test every day, but when I picked up and I was gonna ride a right half pass, I rode that right half pass into my left half pass. And I rode that left half pass, I was going to ride it into my halt rein back. And so that it just became second nature to stream those high quality movements together. And that was a game changer for me. And, and that really brought us to our, our first 80%. Okay, great. I'm I'm gonna lower the the level of the topic, but I have um, an important question that I want to ask you. Uh, we have some amateur writers listening to you, and they have one qu couple of questions that I think are very interesting. One is, what advice can you give to help the, an amateur writer to improve their seat? legs and hands? Um, you know, I teach a lot of amateur riders and I think the first thing they're taught is they've ridden with people who have just pointed out all of their flaws. <laughs> and I find this very frequently that they come to me and they say, oh, I'm not allowed to wear spurs because my legs bounce too much. Oh, I'm not allowed to ride in a double bridle because my hands are too busy. And I say, okay, well, why, why are your hands busy? Well, sometimes my horse pulls on me. I say, okay, well, let's fix that problem. I'm a, a big believer. Yes, I believe in maybe training on the lunge, you know, no, no stirrups, no rein sitting. And if that's a bit of body awareness, looseness in your hips, stability in your core, you know, that definitely is beneficial. But the bigger problem I find in training is that these adult amateurs have never been given permission to become effective, you know? And, and I think there's something, there's a reason why you want to kick your horse every stride. There's a reason why your leg is bouncing on his side. It's not always because the riders are tight. Sometimes it's because they're trying to get their horse to go faster. So I think part of um, teaching riders to to have quiet hands and a quiet seat and a quiet leg is also teaching them to be effective so they can be quiet. Um, and if, like I said, there's a time and a place, I think for being on the lunge line and, and a horse who will go around like that and just let you feel and become body aware and for sure being able to separate your hands if you want to move them, that your leg doesn't move when you move your hands. If you want to post, your hands don't move just because your, your seat is moving. All of those things are important. But I think equally, if not more important, is being able to be effective so that you can create a horse who's nice to sit on. You know, if you're sitting on a horse who's ripping your arms off and stopping when you close your leg and, you know, not softening the back to give you a nice back to learn to sit on, then I think you're a little bit never going to get ahead. Good. And then there's another question from an, adult, from an amateur rider. And it says, as amateur riders, we sometimes feel frustrated. Did you ever experience frustration? And how did you no, feel? No, never. <laughs> I mean, we have, we have to all admit that we're in this sport um, a little bit because we're crazy. You know, we're seeking out perfection that no one has ever achieved. Imagine that. Imagine knowing that you were going to begin every day and never able to achieve perfection. You know, it just hasn't happened in our sport. So I think we have to, to learn to see the humor in that and surround ourselves with other people who are just trying to do the same thing. You know, we want to enjoy our horses. We want to make them more athletic. Um, we want to create stronger relationships with them. And ultimately, yeah, we want to be, most of us want to be competitive, but also I think if you don't want to be competitive in the show ring, that's okay. And I think that's an important thing to admit. 
Um, I think there is a lot of pressure on amateurs that if they're at this barn, that they feel they have to go to the show with all their friends. And I think it's, it's important to understand that it's okay to say you have, you know, your great time with your horse is just at the barn enjoying him there. Um, but frustration will come in a lot of ways, whether it's a horse that you can't keep sound or your horse is going better than ever at home and you take him to a show and you score a 49. It happens. It happens to all of us. If you think I'm riding around every day with horses that don't throw their head up, you know, with horses that don't kick out at my leg, you're wrong. If you don't think sometimes I, you know, a three-year-old leaves the arena with me on him, you're wrong. It does. It happens to everybody. And so I think, again, that comes back to the sense of community, where it's like, this is, we're all going through the same things. And, and it's a little bit, you have to find the humor or you will just really lose your, your love for the sport. Okay. One, one of my favorite, I think one of the favorite movements I've seen on you are the half passes. Uh, you remember that it's always show really, really good half passes in trot and in canter. Any specific tips for your half passes? Yeah, I love to half pass. I find the half pass is really um, a, a movement that leads to higher quality in pretty much everything the horse does. It gives me a real position of suppleness that I can press them forward and also a position of suppleness if I need to bring them back. So oftentimes um, you might hear people say to use the shoulder in and and sometimes that's true, but very often the haunches in or the haunches out, if you're experiencing tension, is a better way to take that tension out of the top line. Um, and I think my, my big thought when I go for the half pass is I don't ride a bunch of half passes. I don't. I ride a super quality trot or a super quality canter, and I will not ride a half pass that does not have a super quality gait. And I refuse to let my riders do the same. So if you're trotting the short side and it looks like a nine or a 10, uh, and as a judge, you must see this all the time. There's nothing more disappointing than when that horse goes into the half pass and it turns into a six. And it's like, where did it go? You know, and the horse has lost their sense of desire on that line, you know? And so um, that's always my focus is, is keeping the horse uh, like a magnet, I say. They have to want to take me where I'm going. And if they lose that urge on the diagonal and the half pass, then the whole movement is lost. Even if uh, you have good crossing and good bending, if the quality of the trot is a six, your, your half pass is not going to be scored as a nine. That, that's absolutely true. And that's very good advice. Uh, then I have another question. Besides riding, do you do any other sport or any other training or workout to keep you fit while riding? You know, everyone always asks me that, and I'm having a little bit of Bluetooth trouble, so we're going to try to get plugged in here. Um, and I should. I really should work out. But um, the fact of the matter is my day... All right, I'm going to turn off my Bluetooth and turn on my computer, okay? It's okay. Let's see if we can get that working. It is working. Yes, go ahead. Do you hear me? You can go ahead. We're just having a bit of an interruption while she fixes that. If you have any questions, just send them to me. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah, can you get a little closer? No, not now. No. 
We cannot hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yes, good. Okay, that works? Very good. Loud okay. Technology, huh? Yeah. Sorry, so what were we in the middle of? We were in the middle of your workouts. Oh yeah, my daily workouts. Um, you know, I'm really lucky that I, I'm a naturally very slim person, but it actually gets to be a bit of um, a, an issue that I have to make sure I am consuming enough calories um, and that I don't drop weight, especially when I'm in competition season because I don't tend to eat as well as I should or as frequently as I should. Um, and so it's more about, we were really lucky in 2016 to bring on Andy Thomas, who is our human physio. And um, he came along and gave us each kind of a program to work on whatever it was that was unique for us as a rider, whether it be just like a horse, suppleness or stability or strength or cardio. And some riders, you know, struggle. They need to make sure they feel trim. They want to keep their weight down. And for me, it's a little bit that I needed to work on stability. I'm an incredibly flexible person. Um, and so it's just a, some little things with resistance bands and activating certain muscles um, and, and I try to get to that when I can. And certainly when we're traveling with the team, it is a, a daily occurrence that I, I do those little exercises, but I try to just maintain my stability and not, um, you know, not necessarily be burning calories. And also I don't want to just become stronger in my own crookedness. So the big awareness that Andy brought to us as riders was symmetry. And we're all naturally crooked. But if you just go to the gym the way you are and get stronger, you just become stronger in that crookedness. And so it was really interesting what he did for us um, as far as making us straighter and, and more equal left to right. That's, that's very interesting. And then I have another question. Between the Grand Prix, the Grand Prix special, and a freestyle, if you get to choose, what's your favorite? special all day long <laughs> um yeah the grand prix is always like a warm-up and you feel like everyone's trying to ride really clean um and i guess the special probably depends on the horse you have which test you like better um it was a good test for diddy for sure and for me the the freestyle was never quite as fun as i ever imagined it in my head I mean, it's fun, don't get me wrong, but it's, it's not fun for me to develop a freestyle is I guess what I should say. So I'm a big advocate that if you ride a half pass and the horse has done a great job, then you let them be finished. And when you're trying to put together a great freestyle, you ride that half pass. And even if it was a 10, if the timing was off, if you're working on your music, you ride it again and then you try to take it into the next movement and so it's more of a, a choreography schooling and that I think is a little bit difficult for me in my head as a trainer is to ride a horse even if they've been really super to keep riding them through these movements just to get the timing for the choreography um, but then you have the the crowds for the freestyles and so that certainly is a is a rush it's is it true that in a big competition that you were not supposed or you were not expecting to qualify for the freestyle and you did qualify and you had to go and get music in town? Yeah, at Aachen. <laughs> it was my first Can you tell yeah, us about it? It was my first Aachen and um, nobody was expecting me to qualify for the freestyle. And it was still something we were working on. I mean, I and I did it totally backwards even to qualify for Aachen. I had a piece of music because it was what I could afford. I had a piece of music and I choreographed my ride to fit the music. And now knowing what I know, it's like you, you have these people, you know, Terry Gallo and other Marlene Whitaker who make these freestyles and you ride your pattern and they make the perfect music. It makes a lot more sense and it sounds a lot better. But that just wasn't in my budget at the time. 
And so um, that piece of music we were working on, um, and it was with Marlene Whitaker that we were working on this, the music I had, and she was chopping it up and going to make it work because I had already guaranteed a spot for the World Games. So I knew I would need one for that. But um, Auk and I just thought, okay, well, I'm lucky to even make it to the special. And I forget where I finished in the special, um, but it was high enough to make it to the freestyle. And so, yeah, that night we had to go out and find um, somebody who had a computer with a, a disc that, that we could burn and make the music. And um, I, to be honest, I can't even remember riding that freestyle. <laughs> I, okay. So you don't even remember how did it go? I have, I could not even tell you, but I did make it to sound check and I had music, so. <laughs> okay, that's very good. That's great. I have some young riders that are, you know, doing this transition from small tour to under 25 and thinking about Grand Prix. What, what would be your advice for them? <clears throat> I mean, I guess it depends in, in which way. I think, um, you know, I never did young riders. I never did any of the juniors, none of the young riders, um, no U25. I don't think U25 was really around when I was U25. <laughs> and um, I think, I think it's a little bit um, misleading because these kids have so much pressure on them to kind of fit this mold. And maybe they don't have the right horse. Maybe their horse is a little too old. Um, maybe they should really spend more time getting, you know, some better basics on them as riders, riding more horses. Um, and so I think, again, I, I think it's a lot of pressure for these kids to fit into that mold. If you've done the juniors, then you have to do the young riders. And, you know, you hear these young riders having that conversation like, oh, so, are you going to do U25s? Or if you ask one of these students how old they are and they're under 25, they immediately want to have that conversation with you. And I think, I think that's difficult. It's a little bit similar for me to when you have a young horse. If you have a nice four-year-old or a nice five-year-old, everyone expects you're going to do these young horse classes or you should fit into that young horse mold. And I think it's really important that uh, more than feeling like you have to be at a certain level because you're a certain age, I think it's always better to seek out the education. So if you have the opportunity and, you know, to show your older horse in the U25 and you're going to go in and score a 62, I don't really see the benefit of that. Um, I would rather see that kid maybe school, learn some stuff on that horse at home, but no one's going to look at your resume and see that 62% and be impressed. So, so learn what you need to learn from that horse. But if you have the opportunity, take on some other rides, show some younger horses, show some more difficult horses and get kind of that experience. Um, so I think having someone, always having a trainer around you who can help you and guide you and maybe give you some different opportunities and to help, I think, relieve that pressure for these kids sometimes that they should be going on to that it's just like the training pyramid, right? It yeah. looks like this, but it doesn't always happen like that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a very good answer. And this leads me to another question. Everybody wants to make progress in their riding and with their horses. And many times, riders and trainers, you don't know, like, are we ready to move on? Or are we going to cross some boundaries that are going to make the whole thing collapse. Yeah. What are your recommendations in terms of progress? When, when can you move a step forward, when you're supposed to move it back, organize everything, and then try to do it again? I think, you know, all of us, I think that's a fine line. And I think sometimes in order to find that line, you have to cross it. I think if you, if you stay too far away from that line, you won't ever make progress. I think a lot of people get stuck there. Um, you know that they are okay with 
you know, just not, not pressing on the horses for more quality or not pressing on themselves to do another five minutes if they feel a little tired. Um, and I think it's, it's easy to get stuck in that place and, and because you, in order to make progress you're going to meet resistance and that's i think why it gets so confusing because a lot of these and even professionals who come to me for help they say oh i tried working on the piaf and the horse rears so i don't i don't do that well let's let's go there let's find out why it's happening because only then can i fix it so i think it's normal to meet resistance. If you don't meet resistance, I don't think you're close enough to the line. And then sometimes you do, you cross that line and go, okay, there it was, I found it, it was two steps before, but at least now you know. But if you don't every once in a while kind of push it, um, then it's never going to move ahead, you know? Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's really interesting. Then I have some questions about cross training. Do you do, do you incorporate like poles or jumping, uh, riding around the fields in your daily training? And, and do you find it beneficial? It's definitely beneficial. I mean, here in Florida, it's very, very flat. Um, so we actually do have a little hill that we've built on the property just for the sake of incline and decline. Um, and I wish we had more hills. Um, and it's something, I mean, all of the horses are used to going for long walks. We have 90 acres here. Um, so it's wow. something to do a lot of. Um, and I usually have Cavaletti set in the arena. So at any point during any day, we can go over it. I am way too chicken to jump. Although it's my secret dream to have both a dressage horse and a jumping horse in the World Cup, but we'll see where that goes. Um, and I, I do, we just built a big pond that I would like to be able to use for swimming. Um, one of the major tools in our training is actually a heart monitor. So it's called a Hilo Fit and we can wear it right under the girth and I have um, a Garmin watch or if you have an Apple watch and you can live time see your horse's heart rate. And I think that's been incredibly beneficial for us. And we know we talk about that line and how hard do you have to push to make progress? If you look at it just from a fitness point of view, it's always a guessing game. Oh, my horse is breathing really hard or always oh, very sweaty, but is he really pushing the limit cardiovascularly where he's going to increase his stamina? And, um, and that's been a really great tool for actually being able to measure that and to know that your horse is becoming more fit. And so whether it's, um, some of them, it's really um, difficult to get their heart rate up. I have one horse who's got some thoroughbred blood in him. You could gallop him full tilt, I don't know, 10 minutes, and his heart rate will stay, you know, maybe 100 beats per minute. And really to be gaining fitness, we wanna have it closer to like the 160 range. And to get him there, I actually have to do a lot of transitions and really make him carry weight. And so what you think might be making your horse fit is actually not what's making them fit. And so it's a really great tool for, for um, being able to actually increase your horse's fitness. And you find, interestingly, that at the show, when the horses are nervous or their adrenaline is high, that their heart rate, even if they're not working harder um, visually, that their heart rate is higher. And so it's taking oxygen out of their muscles, which can ultimately lead to risk of injury. So if we know where they, they tend to, to be at a competition point of view from, from their heart rate, it becomes important then to train them there at home sometimes so they become fit for their competition, you know? And three days going at a heart rate that they never hit at home, you're likely to have a fatigued horse who's going to hurt himself. Good. And what about uh, work from the ground for Piaf Passage? Do you also use that or not? I do. Um, and it depends on the horse, which way they learn it the best. But I think it's very important that the horses are not fearful on the whip. And so I use the whip a lot, a lot on my young horses. And I, t I touch them everywhere. And I just want them to learn to 
to play with it a little bit. You know, that if I touch them here, they pick up a leg, they get a treat, and ultimately it can turn into to a little bit of pia for the horses. But I also want them to be comfortable because as a rider, I find it's helpful if I'm struggling then from the saddle, that someone can help me from the ground and my horse accepts that. So that's more of why I do the work from the ground with the horses. Okay, so then we have some questions here. How do you decide a horse's limitations talent-wise? And how do you advise your clients on their horse's limitations? I don't really believe in limitations. I have a quarter horse who will do a couple one-time changes. He makes a little passage. It all depends on how competitive you want to be. But I believe that you can train any horse to do anything. Um, I think, again, it also becomes for him, his limitation is how comfortable does he stay in his body doing that work, which of course, the way the quarter horse is built so downhill, it was tough on his back to do those things. So I think that's where I make determinations as far as where the horse is limited. If they're either not staying sound um, or they're requiring too much maintenance, um, you know, you find they're, they're, they're breaking down or they're, they're not as happy as you think they would be working at a lower level. But keep in mind, you know, I think we would all be happy working at a lower level, right? <laughs> I mean, I would like to work part time. <laughs> yes. But, um, you know, it's, um, but I don't see any breed. I think you should be able to train them to do anything. It might not be, you know, for the CDI ring, they might not be making the US team or, or something like that. But um, I don't really say this horse has had enough until I see that uh, he's really understanding everything. And when the horse understands and it's a certain level of quality, I'm okay with that. Okay. Then I have, I have a final question of myself. There has been a lot of discussions at the FEI level about horsemanship around the world. And I know this discussion has been in the US, in Canada, in South America. Uh, people, many people are worried that our young riders are not really aware of horsemanship and are raised in kind of a different way that we were all raised, where you learn what really horsemanship is. What, what do you think about that? And, how important do you think it is and how would you approach that? Um, wow, that's a big final question. Um, unfortunately, I do believe that. Um, I think, unfortunately, in order to be competitive, the quality of horse that is needed um, tends to be very expensive tends to be available to um, kids, young riders, who have the means to have their horse in a program where that horse is looked after by a staff, is groomed by a staff, their stall is cleaned by a staff, the, the bridles are cleaned, the horse is trailered to the show, presented, ready, handed off to the, the kid. And, um, you know, it's certainly, um, a luxury and um, to say that I'm I was and maybe still am a little jealous um, is definitely true but where I can say I'm you know where I feel a little bit sorry for those kids is that they will never have that relationship with the horse that I have which is why I, I get up every morning and, and come into the barn um, I don't know how you change that. I think it's going to be incredibly difficult. Like I said, with the, the great expense of these great horses, it becomes very difficult to say um, without some sort of sponsorship um, for these kids where they can have a quality horse or a type of luck situation that I ran into where we purchased um, a foal that turned out to be a superstar, but we certainly would not have had the means to purchase him at an older age. Um, I, I couldn't afford that horse. So I think 
I think the best thing we can do is to, as trainers, um, really try to make sure these kids become responsible for their horses. And even if I think maybe more difficult than managing the, the youth sometimes is managing the parents and saying, you know, in order to, to be a part of this, your kid has to be responsible for their horse. Um, and I do think we would probably see a decline maybe in some of the participation but I don't know how, how you can require it or change it all together. Um, because like I said, the, the expense of those top quality horses is not available for everyone. Um, but I do think it's the most important part. I mean, I will, I will, you know, hands down say that probably the only reason I was so successful um, is because I was hands-on. I'm still hands-on with my horses every day. I think those kids who don't know what their horse's legs look like, they don't know, you know, what their stall looked like that morning. Did they sleep? Did they, you know, stress all night? Were they walking in circles? Was their stall a mess? How much water did they drink? Um, were they chewing on the wood in their stall? I, you know, all these things is going to hold them back from really being the best in the world. Um, and I remember, again, Robert Dover said to me one day after I'd had a moderately successful Grand Prix in Wellington, I think it was upper 60 somewhere. And I came out and I was so excited because I think it was a clean test. And Debbie and I, Debbie McDonald and I were talking and Robert walked by and Debbie said something like, Robert, did you see that? And he said, yep, now she has to decide if she's gonna go run that mediocre business or if she's gonna give up everything and become, become one of the best in the world. And he walked away and I thought, I never wanted to strangle him more in my life than when he said that to me, because I thought, if only it were that easy, you know? Yeah. And knowing him now, such a good friend of mine, it's coming from the very best place. But um, I think if you haven't had to struggle for it, if you really haven't had to work, I don't think it's as sweet. I don't think you appreciate it as much. And um, I really did, you know, I, I gave up everything. And in the end, it was no sacrifice at all. I would do it all again in a heartbeat, but I knew everything about that horse and it helped me manage him. And so I knew every time I went into that arena, he was gonna give me everything he had. And you can't ask that from a horse that you don't give everything you have to. That's, that's great. I cannot finish without two final questions. One is from me, and it's what horses do you have for the future? And one is from one of our participants, and she's saying, I want to say it exactly the same. How can we support Laura for the future? <laughs> Well, that's very sweet. I always say, you know, I've, I've been so lucky. Most people never have in their lifetime what I've had. Um, and if I knock on, knock on wood, if I were to die tomorrow, I've achieved every um, dream I ever had as a kid. And that's, I mean, that's incredible to say. Um, I feel very, very lucky. But, um, I do have some, I said, it's no one's responsibility except my own. If I want to keep doing this, I can't expect people to feed me horses. Um, but I've been very lucky again, that, that I do have some really nice horses in my barn. Um, I have, uh, probably a lot of people have heard. I have now the, he was the five and I think six year old champion sensation HW. And I've had him now since, uh, maybe March, maybe beginning of April. And he and I have just bonded incredibly well. And I'm super, super excited to show him a little bit maybe next year. Um, just again, get to know him in the show ring. I know he has plenty of miles. So I just want to learn how to manage him when he's showing. Um, and then I have some really big, big uh, goals for that one. He's a lot of fun. And um, I can't wait for everyone to see him. And I do have now a, a five-year-old, a four-year-old, and a three-year-old, who I all think are, are definitely top international quality and, um, dare I say, even 80% horses. So 
um, if I can be fortunate enough to kind of keep this string coming along, um, you know, it takes, it takes a lot of trust to have these, these owners, these sponsors, relative strangers, really, um, completely trust me. And I take that very seriously. And I, I don't take on a lot of horses, um, because again, I'm, I'm so hands-on, but it also makes me very slow. <laughs> so I, I don't get that many done in a day. Um, but I'm, I'm loving life right now. I had a day the other day where I looked at my groom and I said, oh my gosh, sometimes I just get so excited. I have these rides. I had a ride on a three-year-old and a ride who is like barely under saddle. And then a seven-year-old who's doing pretty much a little bit of everything. And I just get so excited like it's the first time. Um, and so I'm looking forward to, to doing it again and again and kind of achieving what Isabel has done for Germany, you know, but doing that for, for the U.S. Laura, thank you very much. You're really an, an inspiration for many, many people, certainly an inspiration for all of us today. Thank you very much for your time and thank you everybody for attending tonight. This will be on YouTube and I'm sure many, many people will watch it. I'm really thankful. Thank you for having me. Okay, thanks a lot, and I hope to see you soon in Florida, probably during the season. Yes, 2021, hopefully better than 2020. <laughs> okay, so now I'm gonna stop the recording.